Well, I invite you to open a Bible to Exodus chapter 3 and John chapter 6. We're going to be looking at both of these passages this morning as we start the new year, we begin a new sermon series looking at the I am statements of Jesus because many of us, when we begin a new year, begin with resolutions, or we begin with hopes and dreams, we begin with goals, we begin with things that how we want the year and our lives to go. Sometimes it's comparing it to the past year and saying, I want these things to go better. I want to improve in these areas. And while all of those are wonderful things, a lot of times we forget about the most important things in life, right? So anybody have plans this year, even if they're just a figment of your imagination, to be healthier than last year? I'm off to a good start but it's only been a week, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how next week is going, all right? Doing better, right? Sometimes we have plans for um, career opportunities or education. Maybe we have relationship goals or things we want better and um, relationships within our own families or with our spouses. There's all kinds of things where we say, these are really important to me, right? These are incredibly necessary for my life and my happiness. And we set our whole focus and all of our desires on those things. And yet, oftentimes, maybe it does make the list, right? But I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But sometimes we're a little guilty of it's either at the bottom of the list or it's not on the list at all of I want to know Jesus better. Now, I'm saying that specifically for a reason. Because I'm sure there's times in your life and years where you say, I want to read the Bible more, right? I want to pray more. I want to serve more. I want to give more. I want to help out more. I want to volunteer, whatever it might be. There's different areas where you say, I want to do better in living out my faith. But very rarely do we actually say, I want to know Jesus better. You see the difference, right? So it's like, well, I want to do these things better because they're the good things, right? I'm going to help out people more. I'm going to serve people more, read my Bible more, pray more, forgive more, whatever it might be of living out my faith. But I want to start off the new year with us pausing before we jump into all the things we're supposed to do, right? That's usually what people um, tell me. In my experience as a pastor, I've had people over the years come up to me and go, you talk about Jesus too much. I've actually had that happen to me before. They're like, what are you going to get to the real stuff or the practical things of the faith, right? Which is, on one hand, understandable. I'm always a little heartbroken on the inside as a pastor, (laughs) but I also understand it, right? It's like, we're going to set goals. It's a new year. I want to improve myself. So we also think I want to get better spiritually. So we make a list. We set goals of what? Things I want to do or get better at. And so I need some practical guides and hints and steps I can take to get better at those things. And those are good things. And many of those things God has commanded us in his word to do and to be obedient in. But we also need to remember that part of our goal as a Christian should be to know Jesus himself better. Because ultimately the foundation of you know, you living a, a, a better, more improved you as a Christian and, and growing in your faith and your spirituality and all these things that you might want to work on in the coming year are all grounded in actually knowing who Jesus is and his love for you. You don't want to actually skip that step, right? We want to. We're like, oh, just get to the practical steps and what do I do for this situation? What do I do for that situation? And so I'm going to annoy all of you people that love to make lists and are type A and just want to get things. To, anybody like that in this room right now? You're going to love this sermon series. Because <laughs> before we jump into all of that, here's what we're going to do to start the year. We're going to simply slow down. We're going to pause for a little bit spiritually. We're going to say, how do I get to know Jesus better? Who he is fully. His, his love for me, his love for all the people in your life. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at the I am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John. There's um, seven of them. So if you're wondering how long this is going to take, that's how long it's going to take. There's seven of them. We're going to look at all of them. 
But what they're based on is in the Old Testament reading out of the, God, out of the book of Exodus in chapter 3. And the context is that Moses has been living in the wilderness for a while. He's married a woman. He's starting to have children. And then God has plans for Moses' life. Now, just so you know, if you haven't heard this story before, Moses doesn't like God's plans <laughs> for Moses' life. Moses wants to do other stuff, okay? But before we get to that, God appears to Moses very famously in the burning bush. And he calls Moses over, and Moses goes over there, and he's a little curious, and he's a little panicked, and he's a little odd of, of the situation and that it's God speaking to him. And he's telling Moses some very important things, three very important things for us to understand who God is and who our Jesus is. The first thing that he tells Moses is that he is the God who hears the cries of his people. The thing that has motivated God to come down and appear to Moses in this miraculous way and to speak to Moses is that he loves his people and he has heard their cries. So the first thing that God is teaching Moses and you and me about knowing who he is is he's the God who hears our pleas, he hears our cries, he hears our deepest, heaviest kinds of sighing type of prayers. The second thing that he teaches Moses is that I have come down, he says in verse eight, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. So the first thing is, I've heard their cry. The second thing is, I've come down to be with them in the midst of their suffering. And if you are familiar with the story of Exodus, you know that throughout the whole story, God travels with his people every step of the way. He makes it so that he can dwell with them and live with them and be in the center of their caravan the entire journey. So the second thing that God is teaching us about himself is that he's not just the God that hears our cries, he's the one that responds by coming down to be in the midst of all those cries, all that suffering, with his people. And the third thing when he says, I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. He's the God who comes to bring rescue and redemption. He's, he's actually the God who's powerful enough to fulfill the promise and actually deliver them out of their hardships, out of their difficulties. Because it's one thing, right, <clears throat> to have a family member or a friend, someone that you're close to, to pray with you, right? Anybody ever had that? No hands, great. So we're off to a bang and start this year of participating with me, all right? <laughs> Show of hands, anybody had someone pray with you when you were going through a hardship? All right, all right? It's comforting, right? It's powerful and it's good news. It, it makes us feel better, it makes us feel encouraged and loved, right? And then sometimes in life when we're going through something difficult, we're struggling, and we have people not only praying with us, but sometimes we're blessed enough to have people walking with us through it, right? They're with you every step of the way. They might not have all the answers. They might not know what's going to happen next or how to get through it, but guess what? They're there with you, right? And that's wonderful, and it's powerful, and it's comforting. But this third thing is what makes our God so special and unique, better than any human relationship you and I could ever have, is not only does he hear our prayers and in a sense pray with us, not only is he with us when we're struggling or suffering or going through something difficult, he's also the God who's powerful enough to do something about the circumstance or the situation. Right? He says, I've come down, and you're like, wow, that's great. Right? If he would have stopped there, Moses still would have been amazed, because he's like, it's a burning bush that's not burning and he's talking to me. This is amazing. But God says to deliver them. This is why I've come down, to deliver them. I'm not just here to pray with you. I'm not just here to be with you and comfort you. I'm also here to rescue you. And Moses goes, wow. And that's the end of the story. Now, of course, Moses is like, well, that's really great and kind of overwhelming. And then God goes, but here's how I'm going to do it. 
I'm gonna send you, Moses. At which point, Moses gives the wrong Sunday school answer, (laughs) but the most accurate human answer, which is, you should pick somebody else. Anybody ever, anybody willing to raise your hand boldly and bravely and say, God, you've picked the wrong person, and I know the best person for the job, and it's not me. Anybody ever done that, had that conversation with God? Because you're just like, I'm getting out of this somehow. And so Moses and God are gonna have a, have a bit of a powwow for the rest of the chapter. Because God is saying, Moses, here's how I want you to do. I want you to be the one who brings that good news of who I am and what I'm going to do and have done for my people to my people. And Moses has a wonderful question. Now, his motives for asking it are because he doesn't want to do it. But the question he asks is, who are you? <laughs> like, like when, when somebody asks me, who is your God? Who is this God that has heard our cry? Who's this God that's come down to be with us? Who's this God that's going to deliver and rescue us out of our bondage, out of our suffering, out of our difficult circumstances? Moses asked God, what's the name I give them? How do I describe you? How do I define you? And then God gives the most helpful answer ever. He says, I am who I am. Now, let's just imagine you're at a party. Anybody ever been to a party where you didn't know everybody and how awkward that always is? All right, New Year's Eve, I was at a wedding reception. I knew three people, (laughs) and I clung to them the whole night. You'd be very proud of me. <laughs> like, I'm not making any new friends. These are the three people I know. These are the three people I'm leaving knowing, all right? But what do you usually do? The first thing you're kind of introducing people or getting to know people is you ask people's what? Names. Like, you know, then you get to the whole what do you do eventually in business, right? But you want to know people's names, right? So you can forget it five seconds later. Anybody have that spiritual gift? Someone says, hi, I'm Mark. And you're like, hi, Bob. <laughs> right, but you ask their names. Now, if someone gave you their name, you ask them, and they go, well, I am who I am. How many of you would go, well, that's not helpful? Right, would anybody be like, that clears it up for me? Now, right? No, you'd, you'd be what? Probably a little frustrated, a little annoyed. You'd want to know what? Well, what's your name. And that's the question that Moses asked God. What is your name? Who do I call you when people ask me, who's your God that hears my prayers, that is with me in my suffering, that delivers me out of my difficult circumstances? Who is your God? And God's answer is, I am who I am. Right now, depending on your English translation, Some will say, I am who I am, or I am, or I will be who I will be, because it's a Hebrew word that we don't actually really know how to translate. It's where we get the name Yahweh from. If you ever heard that name, this is the first where it comes from. But what we do know is that it's based on the Hebrew word hiyah, which is the word to be or to exist. And so when God gives the answer, what's your name? What kind of God are you? He says, I'm the God that exists. I'm I'm the God that is. Meaning, I'm the God that is over and creates all of life and sustains all of life. I'm the God of the universe. Another way I said it is he's saying, like, I'm existence. Right? Like, oh, that's really big. And Moses goes with it. He's like, well, all right. And he goes off to do what God has told him to do, and he tells the people. But when you get to the Gospel of John, and Jesus begins doing miracles, and he begins teaching, and he's doing all all these wonderful things, people begin to ask, well, who are you? Like, okay, your name's Jesus. There's a lot of people named Jesus back then. Who specifically are you? And in Gospel of John, chapter 6, this is the first I am statement, and it comes off of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus does this wonderful, famous miracle. He feeds 5,000 people with a Lunchable, and everybody's blown away, and there's leftovers and everything. 
and the crowd follows him. And then he makes this statement saying, what I'm here to do is do more than just give you physical bread. I'm here to do more than just meet your physical needs. And he says in John chapter six, verse 35, Jesus said to him, I am the bread of life. And this phrase, I am, is picked by Jesus on purpose because he knows that everybody listening to him at the time knew the story of Exodus, knew the story of Moses and the burning bush. So when he's being asked, who are you? Are you a teacher? Are you a miracle worker? Are you a prophet? Who are you? His response is, I am. So what Jesus is doing in these statements is he's claiming to be the God of the universe, the God that we see coming down to deliver his people in the story of Exodus with Moses. And everybody knew what he was doing because eventually he gets in trouble for saying these things. But he's saying, I am that God who hears your prayers, who is with you in your suffering, right? At Christmas that we just celebrated, the famous names for Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And I am the God who is here to deliver you. And ultimately, they love him for the feeding of the 5,000. What Jesus is doing here is when he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He's not saying, I came just to meet physical needs, but he said, I've come to fulfill all of your spiritual needs. I've come to fulfill the things that you really need for all eternity. I've, I've come to fulfill the longings and the cries of your very soul. And so Jesus is making this claim, I am the God who hears your prayers, who is with you in the midst of suffering, and is here to deliver you. Now, at another point in the Gospels, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. And he says, give us this day our what? Daily bread. So here's a couple of things that I want to make clear about who Jesus is. Jesus doesn't ignore our physical needs, right? He doesn't just say, hey, I'm here to meet your spiritual needs, and that's great. Because the reality of life is we all need what? Our daily bread. There are physical things that we need to exist in this life. And Jesus teaches us in the Gospels using this metaphor of him being the bread of life that he not only meets our spiritual needs, but he's here to be the God who meets and cares about our physical needs and the physical needs of people around us. And so we pray, give us our daily bread. Why do we do that? Because Jesus told us to pray that. Why did he tell us to pray that? Because he is a God who cares about you and he knows, guess what? You need food and you need water and shelter and clothing and money and all these things. And so one of the beautiful things about Jesus is he cares about the whole you. Right? He doesn't just care about the spiritual side. He doesn't just care about the physical side. He cares about your whole being. And so he tells us, I want you to pray about these things because he knows we need them. And then another aspect of this in the Gospel of Matthew, he says, don't worry about tomorrow, which is I'm sure you're all doing a great job of not worrying about tomorrow, right? Or the next year. And the reason Jesus says not to do that is because he doesn't you know, think like, oh, well, you don't need tomorrow. You don't need any of those things. No, he tells the people, don't worry about those things because he says, your father in heaven knows that you need them and he cares for you. So we have a God who not only sees our spiritual needs, but he also sees our physical needs. We have a God who cares about our whole existence, our whole being. And then he says, I'm the bread of life, right? And the response to the people is a little bit of confusion and wanting to know more. And so he explains, he says, all that the Father gives to me in verse 37 will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. 
For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. So Jesus uses this language of I've come down from heaven. If you're familiar with the Exodus story, when the people are wandering in the wilderness, they realize there's no price chopper here. And they're like, we are in big trouble because there's no grocery stores, there's no clothing stores, there's nothing. And you know what they do? They humbly and graciously go, that's okay, the Lord will provide. Just like you and I do, right? You never worry about tomorrow. You just say what? The Lord will provide, it's gonna be fine. And you sleep like a baby, right? How many of you do the opposite like I do? You're like, don't worry about tomorrow. Let me tell you, Jesus, why I'm worrying about tomorrow and why I'm gonna lose sleep tonight. Anybody done that version of it? Yeah, that's what we typically do. And that's what the people of Israel did in the story of Exodus. God says, here I am. I am your God who hears your prayers, is with you in all things, and is here to deliver you. And their response is, tomorrow looks really scary, and I don't know how we're going to get through it. And they had nothing. And so they grumbled, and they complained, and they pointed the finger at God, just like we all do. And God's response was, here's some water, here's some quail, and then here's something special called manna, or type of honey-type bread, bread from heaven. And each and every day, the story is that as they went to the wilderness, God provided them with their daily bread, everything that they would need in that moment. And they were also told in the book of Exodus that their clothing never worn out. So God took not only care of their spiritual needs, but he met them and took care of their physical needs. Now, what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, but I'm going to do something even more than that. Right? I fed you with the 5,000, and it drew a lot of people like, that's really cool. When he says, I'm the bread of life, I've come down from heaven, what he's saying is, the God that took care of you and met all your needs when you were wandering around in the wilderness through the manna, I'm the bread of life. I'm that God. So what he's doing is he's teaching you and me that he is a God worth trusting with all of our hopes, all of our goals for the next year, all of our fears and worries about the next year and tomorrow. He's like, I'm the God you can trust with all those things because I'm the God who hears all of your worries, hears all your fears, hears all your prayers and crying out. I'm the God that walks with you through the wilderness and all the ups and downs of life. And I'm the God who has provided for his people time and again. He said, I have a track record of keeping my promises, of delivering my people, of caring for them and meeting their needs. And here's the ultimate need that he's going to drive home. Because it's wonderful that he, that he meets our physical needs. And he, and he cares about our whole existence, both physically and spiritually. But in verse 40, he says something very important. He says, for this is the will of my Father. So he's saying, this is God's will. This is what God desires. This is what God ultimately wants. Not just for people to be fed at the 5,000, but that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So what Jesus said is, here's the ultimate need that you and I have. It's a spiritual need. You and I need eternal life. So here's, let's put a really dramatic point on it. You're gonna die. It's probably not what you're hoping to hear in church one of the first Sundays of the year. What a wonderful pep talk, pastor. But that's the reality of life. You are going to die. The book of Psalms says, one of my favorite prayers, Teach us to number our days, O oh Lord. What does that mean? Got a limited time here. And some of us have lost people, and we know how painful that is and how real that is. And that's what Jesus is saying. Like, look, feeding the 5,000, meeting the needs of people here and now is incredibly important, and he's a God who does it, and he's a God who cares about it. 
But no matter how much you and I eat, no matter how healthy you and I may or may not get this year, here's the harsh reality of a sinful, broken world. We're gonna die. We're gonna lose people. And Jesus is saying, that's why I've come. Because you and I have a greater need that we cannot meet on our own. Because some of you don't like Jesus sometimes, because he's telling you what to do. And you got people in your life that don't like Jesus, and they're like, well, I don't need Jesus because I work hard. I provide for myself. I pay for these things. I do all these things myself. And you can argue with God about that. But there's one thing you and I cannot argue with God about, is that, is that we're gonna die. And no matter how much you try, no matter how much effort goes into it, guess what? Ultimately, one day, you and I will be powerless to stop it. Like, you're not gonna be able to try harder. You're not gonna be able to spend enough money. You're not gonna be able to put more effort in. And so Jesus has come, not just to meet some of our needs when we're having a bad day and we need some comfort, although he does that. He hasn't just come to meet physical needs and provide for us in this life, even though he does that by promising to give us our daily bread. Ultimately, he said, I've come to meet your greatest need, which is that you and I need life. We need eternal life. We need a life that goes beyond death, which is why the Apostle Paul, in one of his letters says, the last enemy to defeat it is death itself. And so Jesus comes and he says, this is why I've come. I've come to do the Father's will, which is anyone who believes in the Son, anyone who believes in Jesus will have eternal life, and I'm gonna raise him up on the last day. He's like, I'm gonna give you your greatest need. I'm going to give you eternal life when nobody else and nothing else in existence can. And I'm gonna conquer death for you by his own death and resurrection, by raising you and me up on the last day. And that's who Jesus is. He's a God who hears our cries when we're in trouble. He's a God who's with us in those troubles. He's a God who delivers us out of those troubles, both spiritually and physically. He cares about our whole existence. But ultimately, he is the God who delivers us from our greatest enemy, which is sin and death. And just like in Exodus, when God said, I've heard the cries of my people, and I've come to deliver them. Jesus says, I've come down from heaven because I've heard the cries of my people, and I'm here to deliver them from sin and death. And that's the Jesus I want you to know this year. All the other stuff is wonderful about Jesus. All the things that you can go to the bookstore and find out about, about you know, lessons from Jesus on parenting and marriage and management and all these other wonderful things, how to be a better person, those are all great. But what Jesus is saying, here's the most important thing I need to know about him is that he's the God who's come to meet your biggest need and to deliver you from your greatest enemy by giving you eternal life and delivering you from sin and death. And now here's the practical part. For all of you people that are like, give me something to do, pastor. Well, you're not gonna like it, just like Moses didn't like it. (laughs) After God declares all those wonderful promises to Moses, he says, Moses, I want you to be the one to go and tell my people about it. It is wonderful and beautiful, my hope and prayer for you as your pastor this year is that you would know that about Jesus, that he has come to meet the ultimate need of delivering you from sin and death and giving you what you need most, which is eternal life. But just like God said, I'm sending you, Moses, Jesus eventually tells the disciples, now I'm sending you, into the world because the reality of life is there are people in the world that need to know Jesus. And they don't just need to know his name. They don't need to just know a few things about him. They need to know what you and I know and what we have read today, which is he has come 
to deliver them also from their greatest enemy of sin and death and to give them their greatest need, which is eternal life. And the only way, the Bible says, that they're gonna learn about who that Jesus is is if you and I open our mouths and tell them about Jesus. So two things today. Know who Jesus is. That he is the God who hears your prayers. He is the God who is with you in all the ups and downs of life. And ultimately, he's the God who delivers you from sin and death and gives you eternal life. And the second thing is go and tell somebody. Because the rest of the world needs to know who Jesus is just like you and I do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you have come down from heaven to meet both our physical and spiritual needs, that you care about our entire existence, that you hear our prayers and are with us in all things. We praise and thank you for being a savior who delivers us from sin and death and gives us the thing we need most, which is eternal life. May we be obedient like Moses and go out into the world and share that good news of who you are with everyone we meet. In your name we pray, amen.